Are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Should I try that again? Are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? All right. Well, not only do we have an awesome preacher this morning and a fiery evangelist, uh, somebody with a gift of healing and a gift of teaching coming up here, who's also our worship leader and camp director, let's welcome to the platform this morning, Christy Lynn Hardy. Guys, guess what? Oh, Dad, can you leave that water, please? Well. Oh, just kidding. We both like water. I was going to say I ruined it by saying his name. That's my dad. <laughs> I love him. Go get her. I'm crazy about my dad. Oh, Pastor Rich, thank you so much. Pastor Rich is the man. I just love, oh, I love who I get to go to church with. I love who I get to work with. Like, I could brag about them for a long time. I could. They're all amazing. It's pretty, I talk about this a lot, but it's pretty humbling when you come in at, was I 19? 19? I think I was 19 when I was on staff, when they graciously let me come on staff, and I got to learn a lot from some legendary people here, and they were the most empowering people in the process, which is awesome, because a 19-year-old, a lot of the time, they just kind of get kicked to the curb, you know? But no, our leaders here, they, they see Jesus in you. They see the call inside of you, and they just lift you up, and they say, go, run. Run further, run faster. And I love that. I love it so much. It's so God's heart. All right, do you guys want to do something fun? Because everyone seems a little quiet today. And I'm not a very quiet person. So let's try something. This is one of my friends. He started this, and I like to take it. And so all the youth, they know exactly what we're going to do. Um, so let's stand up. Ready, everyone? Stand up. And I want you to repeat after me so you guys sing very loud, okay? So you're just going to repeat after me. Whoa, you look like Jesus. Whoa, you really, really do. Okay, now look at the person next to you. Ready? Whoa, you look like Jesus. Whoa, you look lo oh. Whoa, you really, really do. Whoa, you really, really do. Good job, guys. Sometimes the repeat kind of throws people. That's why I did the stutter, because I thought some people wouldn't do it. But you guys killed it. Um, Linda, is Linda up there? Oh, you're so amazing, Linda. Um, are those pictures available? Nope, just kidding. Sorry. I sent her an email really late at night. I was, it was a last-minute thing. Linda's amazing. Also, if we're going to thank people, Linda kills the game. She's so wonderful. I'm so thankful for Linda. Okay. So if you didn't know, we just got back from church camp last week. It was phenomenal. It was incredible. God moved in some of the most beautiful ways I've ever seen. Um, it just blew me away. Literally every night I just sat there. And we had, um, I might cry. I didn't think I was going to cry. Um, it's just beautiful seeing 13, 12, 13 year olds and up just basking in God's presence and just going after them with their whole heart, where leaders weren't saying, do this, do this. It was just them just loving Jesus and going so deep in their relationship with the Lord. They'd be praying for each other, they'd be prophesying over each other. And I just sat there like, Jesus, this is really my life. I love this so much, and that's what it's all about. It's just all about people coming alive to Jesus. That's what everyone wants. Everyone wants a king like Jesus. Every single person wants a king like Jesus. And something that's been so encouraging, oh, you guys pretty much get to hear the same message twice, because I feel like this is really big on God's heart. Because a lot of time we give these messages that you hear like, you're a new creation in Christ. You hear all these truths, but then you leave and you're like, why am I not seeing that in my life? Like, who has had that? Who's had that? Where you have these messages that someone says, you know, you're dead to sin. You're alive to God, which is the truth. Like, that is the truth. But if you don't know how to apply that truth in your life, you're just kind of stuck with just some facts, right? 
So this is what I want to talk about today is how you actually apply that truth to your life and how to walk that out, which sometimes we don't like to walk it out as much because it does involve obedience and it involves us taking some steps and some ownership. And so I'm going to give you some baby steps right off the beginning. So some of you will probably be like, yeah, I know that. But there's a reality of sometimes we have to get back to the basics. I found that sometimes you just got to go back to the basics. Sometimes we think that, you know, I found in my life that there are moments where I'm like, God, what's going on? Like, I'm not hearing as well. What's happening? And then I'm like, did I actually take time to be in my secret place with the Lord? Did I, did I get in the Word yet? Or have you ever had it where you feel like anxious and everyone's bothering you? And then you're like, okay, I'm sorry, Jesus, I haven't spent enough time with you yet. I'm going to read my Bible. Has anyone, has that happened to anyone? Or is that just because I'm a girl? That might be just because I'm a girl. All right, how to grow in your new life with Jesus Christ. First of all, read your Bible every single day. Read the Word. Get that truth inside of you. And as you get that truth inside of you, you get to know Him. And as you get to know Him, you get to know who you really are and who you were created to be. Spend time talking to God. We call it prayer. Talk to God. He's so fun to talk to. The Holy Spirit is my best friend. I love spending time with the Holy Spirit. He helps me so much. Ooh. So just spend time talking to God. I love it. We, especially being a youth pastor, it's just so fun because people are like, I don't know how to pray. I'm like, just talk to God. I'm like, no, you totally can. And they think that, well, I'm not good at praying. And I hate that thought where people are like, well, I'm not good at praying. Because for a while, I, I was a little more on the... I guess you could say performance side because I knew how to pray the right prayers. Like I grew up in church, so I could say the right prayer all day long. But it wasn't necessarily out of relationship of just flowing from my heart of, Jesus, I love you. This is what's going on. Like me and Jesus, we have fun. We get down in my car. We like to dance and listen to music and just have a lot of fun everywhere we go. So talk to God. Spend time with other believers. That means come to church. That means get involved in one of the life groups. That means hang out with other people that love the Lord because it's really easy to run when you have other people who are running with you. You know what I mean? I mean, like, basically in running, too, I'm a competitive person. So if I'm running with someone and we're both competitive people, we're going to run a lot further than you would on your own, right? Like, athletes, can I get an amen? Like, if, if you're lifting weights with someone, all of a sudden you're like, I can do five more? Absolutely. So go with people who are going to champion you on. Um. Be a part of worship services. Like I said, join in this stuff. Like you got to fill yourself daily. And when I talk about read your Bible, like Pastor Lynn, Pastor Rich, they can't just be your Bible. Like you got to do it the other days of the week too. It's really important. Okay. Ready for the Bible? I love the Bible. Here we go. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. We'll start with verse 13 because I think that verse is so funny. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it's for your benefit. I just love that verse. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Woo! That's good news. Come on, we got to wake up, church. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. That's good news. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. No longer going to live for ourselves, but instead we're going to live for Christ. So, something happens when you get saved, right? So all of a sudden, you get saved and you become so aware of your need for Jesus and your need to separate yourself from your old life right? All of a sudden, all these sins, you're like, oh, that just, no, I I have to separate myself from that. And that's called repentance, which is a beautiful thing. So the Holy Spirit comes. So here, let's break this down. Salvation. Like I said, all of a sudden you become aware of your need for Jesus. You're like, I need, need Jesus. I don't want my old life anymore. Beautiful. You repent. And the Holy Spirit, he comes into your life to help you walk out your new relationship with God. So right from the beginning, we have someone who's helping us. So it's not just us. 
it, we're not all alone. The Holy Spirit comes to be, to lead us into all wisdom. He is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is the greatest person, and he helps you feel the conviction of the sin in your life. So how many of you, when you started your relationship with Jesus, all of a sudden, we talked about this with the youth, like music. You're like, I can't listen to that anymore. It doesn't feel right. Or there's certain situations, um, certain friends where you're like, ah, this just isn't fulfilling anymore. Um, what are some other things that like when the Holy Spirit starts to convict you, like the way you talk, like cursing, you're like, oh, like you hear it and you're like, that just sounds nasty. Oh, no. And that's the beautiful part of the Holy Spirit. He brings conviction, and I love conviction. Oh, I love conviction. I love it so much. It hurts so good. It's one of those that hurts so, so good because you feel it, and you're like, oh. And the Holy Spirit instantly becomes your indicator of, hey, that's not okay anymore. But guess what? This is where some of us get caught. We think that the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he convicts us of sin, and sometimes we think that just because we're saved that God does the rest of it. But we come to this beautiful point where, where this conviction hits us, the Holy Spirit leads us into the truth, and now we get to walk out in obedience and say, I'm not going to live that lifestyle anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. And we forget that a lot of the time. Do you know what I mean? It happens a lot. Or sometimes we think that I'm saved, so it's all rainbows and butterflies now. It's about to be the best adventure of your life, and it's going to be filled with the goodness of God in ways you couldn't imagine, but you're going to have to start walking in obedience. It says we died to our old life, so we have to walk away from it. We have to recognize the conviction, repent of what's happening, and then repent means to turn, like to go the other direction. So we have to go the other direction. So when that song comes on that you're like, I, I say song because a lot of the kids, we had talked about this, the kids, students, amazing, powerful, young women and men of God, where they would listen to music and they're like, oh, that just doesn't feel good anymore. So they come to this point where it's like, are you going to live in your old life or are you going to listen to different stuff? And so they had to choose it right then and there. I love, these are testimonies that make me happier. I'm, I, love, I love hearing miracles. I wouldn't say they make me happier. It just makes me really excited because I'm really proud of these guys. So this week, just basic things that I'd heard from them. Like, I'm going to brag about my nephew Tanner for a second, because I love him so much. So he has a boat, and he likes to fish, and his friends like to come with him, and he's really good at fishing. Well, some of his friends were in his boat, and he told them, he's like, hey, don't, don't cuss around me. Like, they were just talking like that in a language that he didn't talk anymore. He doesn't speak that way. And he actually made the stand of saying, don't cuss in my boat. Like, don't cuss around me. And that's because he died to his old life. And he went by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is a new life for me now. Some of our girls, so proud of them. Can I say who it is? They, yeah, they gave me a head nod as I look at them. They're like, well, everyone knows anyways. So Taylor and Aaliyah, I'm really proud of these girls. because So we just came back from camp. Like I said, the fire's hot. But we have, we're the ones who get to steward it, who get to keep the flame hot. And they got invited to this really special birthday party, really special birthday party. And it was, this, it was on Friday night, and we had an outreach. We, this Friday, we went out to the streets. We preached the gospel. We saw people healed. It was amazing. Well, these girls, they had this tension of, I have this birthday party that I want to go to. It's going to be a really fun special birthday party, or I could go and preach the gospel. Both of them had this conviction of, well, the people that are going to be at this party, uh, it's not really the crowd I want to be a part of. They're going to do things that I don't, I don't really want to be a part of anymore. And they chose this separation of saying, hey, I'm a changed person. I'm a new creation in Christ, and this is the life I'm going to live. They love that friend. They champion that friend on. They celebrate that friend. But the environment right then and there, they didn't want that anymore. So they chose, actually, on Friday nights, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to preach the gospel, and I'm going to bring people into encounters with Jesus. And guess what they did? And it's just beautiful because they chose it for themselves. 
And in salvation, this happens because we say you died to your old life. Like you died to your old life. So what has to happen is there has to be a clean breakup from your old life. A clean breakup. Because let's see, there are two types of breakups that generally happen, am I right? There's the clean breakup where you're like, we're, we're done, like in a relationship. You break up, you're done talking, you're not going to communicate anymore. It's just a clear cut, done. Then there's the messy breakup, which who has seen the messy breakup, who has witnessed the messy breakup? Anyone here? Which is, a, yeah, we're going to break up. And then, you know, the next day they're like, oh, I love you. My gosh, I miss you. Bah. And then a few days later, they're like, I'm so mad at you. Like, there's this anger in this relationship. It's messy, and it's full of these mixed emotions of people getting hurt. They get jabbed. There's always this underlying, like, anger and this bitterness in the relationship, right? Generally, that's how it works. So in salvation, we repent, which is a clean breakup from our old life. It's a clean breakup. We go the opposite direction. So that means it's a clean breakup with Satan and our past sin. It's saying it's done. I'm completely done. I'm separating myself. It's not saying, yeah, let's break up, and then in a few days I'm going to go back to my old life. It's not that way. Like we have to come to this place of saying, I choose to walk with Jesus to separate myself from that old life, and I'm not going back. I'm not going to go back anymore. But that takes sacrifice that takes you making new boundaries for your life it looks like surrounding yourself with different friends sometimes sometimes it looks like I really love those people but I can't be with them anymore it looks like I'm not gonna party anymore it looks like I'm not gonna do drugs anymore it looks like I'm actually gonna be kind to my family like we have to make these choices and that's the hard part that we see so many times in people's relationships where you have this high experience with Jesus, right? You have this amazing encounter, but then all of a sudden you just kind of go around the mountain. Has anyone experienced that in their life? You have these amazing experiences, and you're like, yes, God, I'm so on fire. I just got healed, and all these things happened to me. But then you go home and, you know, you start doing your old routine and you're like, I just don't feel the same anymore. I don't feel that fire. It's because we're called to walk in obedience with Jesus. Like he doesn't force his love on us. Jesus doesn't force his love. He does not force his love. He gives it to us to choose to walk in. And so it's up to us if you want to burn for Jesus we have to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Like these are very basic things. But if you get this, your life will be completely transformed. It's super basic. But it will change your life. It will change your family's life. It will change generations to come if you teach them how to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Of, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I've died to my old life. I'm not living for myself. I'm living for Jesus. And on Friday, like I said, we have these teens who have come to this realization of, I'm not living for myself anymore. So we were at Walmart. Isaiah was with me, and we did a treasure hunt, which who has done a treasure hunt before? Yes, they're super fun. So what you do, guys who, anyone who is on the treasure hunt, can you raise your hand? That's just a part of the group. Come on, I love it. So what we do is we get this map. And on it, there's person, appearance, um, place, thing they might need prayer for. And so we get together, and we just close our eyes and ask God to highlight people to us. So you fill out these blanks. Then you get together in a group, and you weren't talking before, but then you share them. And you're like, what places do you have? And in our group, pretty much everyone had Walmart. So we're like, well, that's obviously where God wants us to go. So we went to Walmart. And we had a group of five of us, so we split three and two. And so me and Isaiah were together, and on his list, he had, this was his first treasure hunt he had been on. He had bright shoes and a yellow shirt, and he had the name, was it David or John? Was it John? Your, my mom was talking loud, too. I was like, I'm hearing voices. <laughs> he had the name John. 
So we're in Walmart. We're walking around, and all of a sudden, we see this guy with neon green shoes. And I was like, Isaiah, those shoes are pretty bright. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like that initial, like, nervous one of, like, oh, gosh, I think that's the person. So we start, like, following this guy, but trying to not be creepers. And so we're walking down this, like, paint aisle or something. I don't even know what an aisle that we wouldn't be on. And then he walks away, and it just felt like it wasn't quite right. So we're like, oh. And then we look up, and there's a Walmart associate, and he has the name tag John. And I was like, Isaiah, look at his name tag. (laughs) And then we're both like, oh, my gosh, we've got to talk to this guy. So we go up to him, and we tell him, we're like, we're on a treasure hunt. We feel like you're God's treasure. We show him, this guy had this, and your name's John. Can we pray for you? And he goes, my wife prays for me in tongues every day. I was like, that's my kind of lady. You go, girl. (laughs) And so we just encouraged him about just, releasing the glory of God in his workplace, and it was just so fun because it was such a confirmation of God is speaking to me, and he's highlighting people that he wants to love on. Ah! So we walk out, and then we saw Amador, which he's probably with the kids right now. Um, We saw him, so we start talking to him, and we got to prophesy over him, and then Carol comes up, and we start talking to her. We tell him what we're doing, and she... I asked her, I was like, do you need prayer for anything? Like, do you have any pain in your body? She goes, yeah, my back really hurts right now. So we pray for her right in Walmart, right in one of the aisles. She gets healed. And we're like, whoa, yes, God. So she walks away, and Isaiah goes, I had back pain on my list. And I'm like, what? You did? I'm like, we have to tell her. So we go, we find her, we tell her. And she's even more encouraged then. And we... uh, it just went on from there. Like, there's so many divine appointments. Some of our other groups, they went and they got to pray for a homeless guy. They got to bless him, too. They gave him food and water. They met his basic needs there, and they prayed for him. I love that. Um, one of our groups, they ended up ministering to a witch for a little bit, which is awesome. Um, I mean, it was amazing. It's just so awesome because they've realized I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm living for Jesus. We talk about we owe the world an encounter with Jesus. We owe the world an encounter with Jesus. But this wouldn't have happened if these students wouldn't have realized that the conviction of the Holy Spirit that came then, the separation of a clean breakup from their old life of, I'm not living that way anymore. I'm living this way. I'm living my life for Jesus. I'm becoming a living sacrifice so that people will lift up their eyes and see Jesus through my life that through my life, people will see Jesus. Because everything, there's a cost. And sometimes we miss this part, that there is a cost. Any anointed person that you see that operates in gifts, whatever, they've gotten in the secret place, and they've spent their time just getting to know the Lord. Like in the secret place, crying out for more. Just crying out for more. Like something, I shared this with them too, but purity is something. I got a prophetic word over my life when I was young, and there, it was by Jake Hamilton, and he's like, you have fought for your purity, you are fighting, and you are winning, and you will keep winning, and you're going to restore girls' virginities, you're going to pray for them, and their virginities are going to be restored, and it was this word that I grabbed, and I was like, yes, this is something I want for my life. But it costs something. I can't just say, yeah, I want a word of my life will be marked by purity, at like 13 or something years old, I told my parents, I want my first kiss to be on my wedding day. And I chose to walk that out day by day by day, which in high school looked like not dating, which it looks like having different relationships with friends, which it looks like creating healthy boundaries in my life. Because there's a cost. There is a cost to every single thing. If you look at anyone who's operating, you know, they're praying for people and they're being healed, like, yes, there's a gifting. We're called to do that. But there's a cost. you got to walk this gift out. Yesterday I prayed for someone at a funeral, and she had a potty mouth, and, but I knew that God wanted to heal her. prayed for her, she didn't get healed, and it was like kind of the awkward tension there. But I'm like, man, Jesus loves you, and he wants you to be healed. Because there's a cost of laying down your life for Jesus, going with the convictions that he's placed inside of you. It's going to be there, but we have to act upon it. 
And so I just want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, know that you can't just live off of someone else's wave. Like, I like to give the pump-up gospel messages, but this is such a key part of it. If you don't get this, you miss the whole thing. You can't ride someone else's wave. You can't. Like, I wish that I rode my parents' wave for a while because they trained me up in the way of the Lord. But then there comes to a point when you realize, this is what I want for my life. That I, don't, I want to live my life fully for Christ. And then walking that out day by day by day by day by day. Being obedient day by day by day. And it's worth it. It's so worth it. I mean, I could share all kinds of testimonies now, just so you know, a life of saying yes to Jesus and step, like getting ridiculed in high school, all my friends saying I was a fake, I was a fraud, whatnot. In high school, it seemed like the worst thing in the whole wide world. But it led to me coming alive to Jesus, of him opening up doors to me, of going to South Africa, all kinds of stuff like that, because he loves to bless his children. But we have to respond. We have to respond. And we have to lay our lives down and realize we're not living for ourselves. There's a much bigger purpose, much bigger purpose and picture for everyone's life. And so I encourage you and I challenge you to run the race with all that you have. To not live a mediocre life. To not live a half-hearted, I go to church on Sundays, I party during the week. Your your life will feel like hell. You never feel good. You always have this thing inside of you where you're like, it's just not right. It's not right. You, You never have the peace. Because we're called to lay our lives down. We're not called to live a life of compromise. It's 24 7. Like, he's coming back for a bride that is on fire. He's not coming back for a bride that was like, hey, I really loved you on Sundays. The rest of the week, I liked my friends a lot more. The rest of the week, I liked my life of just being comfortable a lot more. He's coming back for a bride that is on fire, that is just wholly devoted to him. When he's given it all to us, it's really easy to respond and just, you can have it all, Jesus. You can have it all. You can have it all, Jesus. Because you are so worthy, Jesus. You can have it all, Jesus. You are so worthy, King Jesus, and we don't want to live a mediocre life. We don't want to walk out half-hearted love, Jesus. Jesus. So, God, I thank you for every person in this place. Lord, I thank you for the calls that you've placed inside, and I thank you that when one of us says yes, it just becomes contagious. It becomes so contagious. I have to share this visual because this really impacted me one time. My grandpa, he's a beautiful communicator, but he talked about if there was one person that caught it, that caught the vision of laying down their life for Jesus. And then they impacted this person. And this person all of a sudden laid down their life for Jesus. And then this person went and got someone else. You grab someone, and then I come and get you here. And we realize what it looks like to just lay down our lives. And it's a trickle effect where all of a sudden everyone is in the game. You grab, each person grabs someone. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. That each grabs someone because one person laid down their life fully for Jesus. So, that's a different message than my normal messages, but it's really big on my heart because I believe that I'm just tired of seeing people really struggling in their lives, in their relationship with the Lord. I'm tired of seeing friends who all of a sudden are like, I don't know if I believe. It just hurts. And it's because they were never fully in, and they were just riding someone else's wave, but they never chose for themselves that I'm living my life for Jesus. And and I'm ready to see a body that's mature and that's strong 
and that is found and rooted in the faithfulness and the goodness of God because they personally have gone to him in the secret place and just saw his face. So I champion you on to run with all that you have and to count the cost. To not just live this half-hearted life, but to count the cost and know that nations are waiting. All creation is waiting for the manifest sons and daughters to rise up. All creation is waiting and groaning for us to realize who we are. So rise up. Rise up, body. Let's do this. Because we have a lot of people out there that are waiting for us to get it. We have, I'll share another testimony of just on Friday night. One of our students, she came. She's a little evangelist. I tell you what, she brought three friends on Wednesday, and she brought one of her friends to outreach. And uh, I just assumed her friend loved the Lord because she brought her to outreach. Little did I know. So she came. She was hanging out, but she was kind of timid the whole time. And our student, she uh, tells me, my friend has really bad back pain. She has scoliosis. I was like, well, let's pray for her. So we prayed for her, and she was like, oh, my lower back still really hurts. Um, and I was like, okay, well, come over here. So we set her down a bench. This is right on Indian Creek. We weren't in, like, a, a church service. We're just all hanging out. And we sit her down on this bench, and I hold up her legs because I felt like the Lord was saying that one of her legs was shorter than the other. So I had them look. I was like, is it shorter? Is it shorter? They're like, yeah. So they all saw. I was like, you see that it's shorter? She's like, yeah. So we just pray, leg grow in Jesus' name. And it wasn't a let me pull your leg out. It was just a leg grow in Jesus' name. And it grows out instantly. And I was like, all right, you should stand up now. If you stand up now, the pain should be gone in your back. So she stands up, and she's like, yeah, it's gone. I was like, that's Jesus. Like, Jesus loves you so much. And like I said, I assumed this girl loved the Lord. She's on outreach with us. She's hanging out like she's hungry. And so she gets healed. I'm like, Jesus loves you so much. And she's not responding the way that I thought she would respond, which is like, my back got healed. Because that's, I freak out about stuff. And she's just like, yeah. Like, just kind of like caught off guard still, like shocked, caught off guard. And I'm just like, woo, yeah, it's exciting. Woo, yeah. Jesus loves you so much, and he healed your back. And later, I get a text from our, so one of our students, her name's Layla. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Layla texts me, and she goes, oh, my goodness, my friend is an atheist, and she encountered the power of God tonight. The one who got healed was an atheist. <laughs> and she got healed right then and there. And she's like, she encountered the power of God. I was like, what? Like Taylor was with me. I was just like, she was an atheist. Are you serious? I was like, did you know she was an atheist? She, we're both like, we had no idea. But it was that obedience of realizing that creation's waiting. Like we don't play church. We don't, we don't play church games. It's, it's hell or heaven out there, you know? Like there are people that are just waiting to hear about the hope of Jesus. And until we step out and realize, I'm not living for myself. I died to my life a long time ago. Who's going to do it? So now we have a girl who just got healed, and all of our students are jazzed about seeing her get saved. Like She got healed, now she's going to get saved. Because they died to their old life. So it's a big picture. There's a lot of souls that are waiting, and they're excited. I told you, creation's crying out. Creation's groaning. It's crying. That's our sign. Wake up. <laughs> so let's do it. Let's rise up. Let's wake up. So Jesus, we thank you for the harvest, God. I thank you for the souls upon souls upon souls that you're calling into the kingdom, that you're wanting to woo with your love, Jesus. And we realize that you want to do it through us. But it comes by laying our life down and counting the cost. About dying to our old life and living just for you, Jesus. So I thank you. I thank you for the harvest, God. I thank you for the harvest. And we say yes and amen to all that you want to do. 
You are so worthy, Jesus. Amen. All right, Pastor Lynn, I get to tag team a little bit with my daddy today. So I got to be the one that uh, did the intro for him. Now he gets to try to go off of that. Bless you for that, daddy. <laughs> intro. That was an incredible message. Yeah. I'd like to uh, first to tag on to what she was talking about, conviction and uh, conviction and repentance. The first conference that I ever went to was in Nashville, Tennessee with R.T. Kendall. I've shared this before, but I thought, man, it just... It just came to my mind, came to my memory again. It's like, he said, the closer our relationship gets with the Holy Spirit, the closer we get in relationship with our Heavenly Father, the shorter the gap between conviction and repentance. Yeah. Yeah. That we will quickly recognize when the Holy Spirit points out to us, convicts us, we will quick, quickly recognize, repent, and turn away from that sin that, that, that he's shown us that we've been convicted of. Oh. I was just thinking of the next, the next step, the next step. Christy's talking about we turn. We, the old man is dead. We're not going back to that. We've turned away from. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus now, and we walk that, that new creation out. And what it feels like to walk that out, and I really have a couple of scriptures that I want to, uh, want, want to read right off in Psalms 37 and 4. As we become that new creation, as we, as we are continuously renewing our mind, we're putting God first. I think about how most people that end up with any kind of encounter want God to be in their life. Is that right? If you've had an encounter, if you've gotten healed, if you've been blessed, you want God in your life, right? Everybody agrees? Yeah. But oftentimes, I, I see so, so, so many times, and I was guilty of it myself, so I recognize it quite easily, where, yes, I want God. I want this in this box. I want this... I want, I want that house, I want that boat, I want that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. There is nothing wrong with, with desiring and with wanting. But so oftentimes, and I, and I was so guilty of it myself, not even realizing that, yes, I want God in my life, and yes, I prayed to God, but I had this. My business and my financial goals was, was here and it was like a straight line across almost. There were, there were some little jogs to it when you look at priorities. I'm talking about priorities. It's like, God, he, he was right in line. Yes, I want God to be a part of my life. I want to serve God, but along with several other things. Jack Taylor says, anything that you have to check with first before you can say yes to God is an idol in your life. It's like, oh. So when we have anything else... I mean, the Word tells us that He is a jealous God. And we think of jealousy as a really bad thing, but I'm glad that my wife's jealous of me and that she doesn't want me to love anybody else as much as I love her. That's a good thing that she loves me that much, that she's jealous of my affection and of my attention. And we serve a jealous God who's jealous of our affection and of our attention. So it's really important that we, as Matthew 6.33, as Matthew 6.33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of the things that we need will be added unto us. And I want to go back to Psalms 37. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. I had to look up delight just out of curiosity and and delight is great pleasure, it's satisfaction, it's happiness, it's joy. Delight yourself in the Lord. If we find our delight, if we put him in the place that he is the one that we check with first 
because of how much we love him, that we find our pleasure, our satisfaction, our happiness, and our joy in him, then he will give us the desires of our heart. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. I think uh, my son and my son Sean and I were talking on the phone the other day. He's not here this morning, but we forgive him for that. Uh, he said, yeah, Dad, man, I am so, so busy. I like to work about six or seven hours a day, and I like to call it quits, maybe, you know, sell a little something now and then, but do this, this service work thing. And he said, I've been working 12 hours a day, and I hate it. I don't like working that much money. And he says, so when people call me now and say, I mean, he does heating and air conditioning, and it's been hot for a couple of weeks now. We all know that, right? It's hot. He says, Dad, if somebody calls me right now, he says, and telling me, got my personal cell number, telling me that they need help with something, he says, I kind of I run back through, and he said, if I haven't heard from that person in the last couple of weeks, they didn't call just to chat and keep relationship going with me. How are you doing, Sean? What's happening? What's new in your life? He says, they go so low on the priority list that he said, they ain't going to be getting any help from me. It's like, wow. It's about relationship. It, it, it's about relationship. I said, Sean, that's what I've been preaching here. Relationship with God. It's our relationship and where we put him. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. Relationship. I, I think of, uh, I told this story one other time. It's, it's amazing how, how God, as far as how God teaches me, so many times it's through, through the examples that I have to walk through something and the lesson that I learned from the experience of walking through something. And, and several years ago when we were, I was fairly young and uh, had a heating business partnership with my father at the time, and in that heating business, I had a guy who I went to college with, roomed, roomed with in college for my short stay in college, but uh, his, you know, well, I'll just call him Bob, how's that? So I can refer to him and it won't be names changed to protect the innocent. Bob worked for me, worked with me, and he was, oh man, he was my good, good friend. I loved and appreciated him. I was also starting in the real estate business. I was buying and remodeling some properties Well, I was thinking that this friend of mine, Bob, was very gifted. He'd been working for me for a few years now. I think it had been three or four years for me and with me. And, and uh, he was engaged to be married. So a house that I had been working on and he'd been helping me work on, he'd learned a lot about remodeling. And, and uh, I was thinking, man, Bob and I can be partners. I have this knowledge. I have this ability. I have a handful of houses now. And uh, he's getting ready to get married. I've got a great solution. I'm going to gift him this house, my equity in this house that's now finished. It's remodeled. It's ready to move into. He's a newlywed. He's going to move into this house, and he's going to be so blessed. He's going to have a tiny little mortgage payment because it has a small, small mortgage on it and a ton of equity. I'm going to gift Bob with this house for his wedding, and he and I are going to do amazing things as partners together. This is just going to be the first of many things. And we're going to do some other real estate deals. And, and he probably will be in the heating business. He's going to become a foreman. And I know he'll end up becoming a superintendent because he's gifted. And when I give him this gift, ow, it's, it, he's going to be so, so blessed. And we have an amazing future partnering together for the future. So as soon as he got married, I gave him... I. I gave him the deed to the property, gifted him this for a wedding present. One time in my life I've done that. And he was blessed and he was encouraged. And, and man, it was, it was hugs and tears and all of that. And, and uh, he and his wife moved into that house and, and they really enjoyed living in that house. And they started adding up the equity that they had there and he did not have his degree finished either. He had two years in into an engineering degree. And he and his wife decided, we take the equity of this house, this will finish my education. I can go back to school, finish my education, get my degree, 
and this will pay for all of it. There are no, no student loans, no anything. We can take this gift and do that amazing thing, but it's for his future privately had nothing to do with the partnership. So the gift that I gave him, oh, he loved it, he appreciated it. And when I preached on this the last time, I was preaching on love without a hook or an off switch. That when we give a gift to somebody, we're giving them a gift with no control, no hook, no nothing. We're just giving a gift. But I had, a, I had the expectation that he would become a partner and that this would be a long-lasting relationship, and that I would be able to pour into him more, and then I would begin to reap. Not the case. He sold the gift, went off to... Well, went off to Utah to, to college, finished his engineering degree, and we completely ended up parting ways. We had some conversations, you know, friendly conversations about it, but, and the Lord brought that back to me, and I'm thinking, well, what does that have to do with this, this message? I, I, don't, I don't know why I would tell this story again. And he said, yeah, you remember how you felt? You gave this amazing gift and you were expecting a, a partnership he said now you know how I feel it's like oh 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 the other side the other the, the other half of the teaching to go along with that story it's not just about you know about love and about releasing in love because our relationship with God is one of free will he gifts us he gives us with a freedom. He takes off the, you know, takes the heavy weight. He carries the heavy load. And he will gift us with many, many <laughs> awesome things. Finances. Uh, he, he's our provision. He is our everything when we put him in first place. If we delight ourselves in him, if we acknowledge the partnership that he wants to have with us, he wants us to partner with him so he can bless us in alignment with the purpose that he has for our lives. Does this make sense? He has a purpose for your life, for my life. He's put gifts into your life and my life so he can partner with us. Another thing that I, I, I want to quickly touch on and point out that's the joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I was thinking, okay, how many times have you heard that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. And what does that mean to you? I felt like I was sitting at the table early, early this morning. And I set my alarm for 3.45 Sunday morning. I get up and I study some more and I... I pray and, and I, I seek the Lord and I was sitting at the table drinking my coffee and I heard you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength it's like yes it's that it's that joy that's bubbling up in me that's what strengthens me and that's what keeps me going and that's what and he's like no that's not it and it's like that's not it what what do you mean that's not it he says, well let's think about another scripture for the joy set before him he endured the cross so that joy that was set before him was looking at my future, was looking at your future, that he was the propitiation, <laughs> he was the price that was paid for our forgiveness, for us to become reconciled to God, to be brought into right standing with God was the price that Jesus paid, and he saw that happening we became his joy. Our future is his present joy, was his past joy. Our future. It's like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I was looked up a little, a, a little bit more joy. Uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's like, and then I thought about Jesus being baptized. It's like, oh, Jesus got to experience the joy of the Father at his baptism when he came up out of the water and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. It's like, I have, this is my pride and joy. 
this is my son. This is my pride and joy. It's like, oh. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. Understanding that my Papa, that my Heavenly Father is delighted with joy in my response to his favor. Okay, is this, did I say that right yet? Did you understand that? It's like, so the joy of the Lord, his, his being delighted in me, then becomes my strength. You know, everybody wants their dad's approval. Everybody wants their dad's approval. And that approval is something that sometimes just holds so many people down because they never receive their father's approval. It's like they will struggle their whole life not even understanding that they're looking for their father's approval. The joy of the Lord and his approval over my life is my strength. You got that? Hesmer, you got it? The joy of the Lord, as he is delighted, as he's dancing over me. It says he dances over us, he sings over us. He is so delighted. In fact, the word says in Luke, it says, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance than there is over 99 righteous that don't need to repent. So, the joy of the Lord in who we are, in Him, is what builds our strength. It's my Father loves me. My Father's happy with me. He approves. And that builds my strength. So I just encourage you this morning, delight yourself. Find great pleasure in the Lord. Find your satisfaction in relationship with him as we worship him as we create that connection like sean says if if somebody really wants my help they need to be in relationship with me and that puts them right up at the top of my priority list we want him to give us the desires of our heart then our heart needs to be in alignment with him. Our delight needs to be in the Lord. I just this morning, uh, the, the message that Christy preached here, I think that, uh, let's just stand together. In fact, I'll ask the prayer team to come up. If the Lord's speaking to you, if Holy Spirit's speaking to you this morning and saying, you know, there are some things that you need to do in your life to get it straightened out, it's time that you make that clean break, that you make that clean break from, from the old man that you, that you have turned from and that you are walking into that new life, that you are becoming the new creation and you're turning from and walking out that new life becoming that new creation that he's called you to be. If that's where you are this morning and saying, you know, I, I need a little encouragement. I need a little prayer. Somebody to just kind of kind of help me. Give me a little boost. Like, Father, I'm wanting to make that commitment this morning. I am turning from my old life. I am turning from my old life. I want a clean break from my old life because this morning, this day, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. I'm making the clean break this morning. And you want to experience his love in a new way that your pleasure, your satisfaction, your happiness comes from knowing and understanding how much he loves you. I just encourage you to come to the front this morning. Let's come up here and, and, and pray together. Let's worship just a little more as, as Jared plays. Let's just worship him. We don't have to have the, the whole band and, and, and the worship music. Just as Jared plays in the background. I just invite you this morning. Let's just get together and let's just, let's just pray. Let's let God know. Let Jesus know 
that we're grateful for the sacrifice that he made, that we love him and that we want to receive all that he has for us. Yeah, I feel like there's someone here who has had just really bad anxiety lately, and it's made it to where you've been having to take some kind of sleep aid recently. And I feel like the Lord's wanting to set you free today to where you don't have to take those sleep aids anymore, but you can actually have the rest of the Father where at night you can sleep and have true rest. So if that's you, if you could come up here, we want to pray for you. If you've been having trouble with sleeping and anxiety has been paired with that, I feel like the Lord totally wants to set someone free today. And just heal that right now. Mm -hmm. If you've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, or you're wanting more, or you're just wanting a, a fresh touch this morning, saying, Holy Spirit, I just want a fresh touch. Blow on me this morning. I just encourage you to come up to the front. Let's pray together. All right, for the rest, Father, we just thank you again. Again, we thank you that you're such a loving, caring Father and that we confess our sins and when we repent, you are so, so pleased that joy breaks out in heaven and with the angels. Rejoicing breaks out in the heaven when we repent, when we turn from the old man. I thank you for each one that, that's gathered here, and I pray a blessing over each one, a fatherly blessing, that they would feel your presence, that they would feel your joy, that they would feel your love and understand that you approve. I bless them now in Jesus' name. Have a fabulous week. Let the light of the Lord shine through you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>